22 years ago, tomorrow, at the time of this video's release at least, hundreds of Japanese aircraft appeared in the skies over Pearl Harbor, launching a devastating attack on the ships of the US Pacific Fleet. Of the nine battleships that were damaged, three, Utah, Oklahoma, and of course Arizona, were far too badly damaged to ever see service again. Three more, Nevada, California, and West Virginia, were sunk, and the final three, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee, had varying degrees of damage, but were at least still afloat. But each of these latter six would be, when necessary, salvaged, and then patched up and sent on to the continental United States for further work before being returned to service. How the ships were salvaged, made seaworthy, and then dispatched for the necessary modifications has already been covered in a three-part series linked in the video description below. But today, we're going to take a look at what happened next, what work was done to the battleship survivors, and what they went on to accomplish once they were back on the high seas. For today's particular video, we're going to look at the three ships that were actually sunk, and we might revisit the three that were just partly damaged later on. And so, of those three sunk but salvaged vessels, we'll begin with USS Nevada, or Nevada, or Nevada. Apparently these are all valid in the US, so take your pick. Compared to her appearance at launch, Nevada had been modernised with a host of upgrades and replacement parts during the interwar period. The most obvious visual difference being the growth of the superstructure, the plating in of her casement battery, and the subsequent elevation of the 5-inch gun positions one deck higher to the superstructure, and of course the replacement of the cage masts with a massive pair of tripod masts whose spotting, rangefinding, searchlight and other platforms conspired at times to give the impression of a ship that was just for some reason carrying a couple of slightly odd looking three to four story buildings around high above the sea. It was in this condition that she tried to get underway in the middle of the assault before an accumulation of battle damage and leaks through various bulkheads that should have been watertight but had been unwisely pierced and then poorly sealed during that modernization and subsequently caused her to take on enough water to have to be run aground to prevent her from going down in a far more awkward place like the middle of the main channel in and out of Pearl Harbor. She completed temporary repairs after being salvaged in late April 1942 and headed over to Puget Sound Navy Yard, right at the northwestern corner of the mainland United States, for another six months of work. As well as the obvious continued hull repairs, she would be the first of the refloated ships to be refitted, and as such would prove to be something of a prototype or test bed for them and a couple of other major wartime reconstructions which would include some of the less damaged vessels eventually. Initially, in view of her age, the Bureau of Ships wanted to effectively restore her back to her December 6, 1941 condition, with the only upgrades being a few 20mm Orlicans and adding power control for her 5-inch 25 caliber anti-aircraft guns, along with maybe some basic radar if they could spare it. She would be relatively quickly cycled through the yards, which was good, and then she would be assigned to secondary line duties only. However, Admiral King overruled this and ordered them to come up with a more complete overhaul. Initially, the response to this was to additionally propose the installation of four quadruple 40mm Bofors to supplement 16 single 20mm Orlicans, and to remove all other secondary and anti-aircraft guns that she'd previously been fitted with, which would then be replaced with 16 5-inch 38 calibre dual-purpose guns in eight twin mounts, arranged four per side in super-firing pairs, which superficially resembled the layout of the 5.25-inch guns found on the British King George V's, but with the pairs closer together, as there was no amidships aircraft launching facility to separate them. This was expected to raise the overall displacement of the ship by around 700 tonnes, which would be compensated for by cutting down the main mast, which is the aftmost of the two tripod masts, reducing it to a minimal height, just enough to carry some rangefinding and direction gear, as well as removing the massive boat cranes, the heavily armoured conning tower, and the armoured tube that it sat on, as well as reducing the amount of main gun ammunition carried. This plan evolved as the details were drawn up, 
Additional superstructure was added to allow for an open bridge, some backup control stations, radar rooms, and a new fire control system for the big guns as they realised the old one had been part of the conning tower tube that they'd just pulled out, and a more comprehensive set of control stations for the anti-aircraft battery. The aircraft catapult fitted on the aft superfiring turret was to be removed, but the rangefinder on the forward superfiring turret was to be upgraded with a new and larger model. The forward tripod mast was slightly trimmed down, and the medium and light anti-aircraft battery grew while she was in dry dock. She emerged with double the number of proposed bofers, now consisting of eight quadruple mounts, and the 20mm Orlicans had risen to a grand total of 41. Both of these numbers would of course fluctuate, usually upwards, over the course of the war. Her new secondary battery was granted four Mark 37 fire control systems, and some basic radar was fitted. The final flourish of this refit was a rather jauntily raked extension to her funnel, which served mainly to direct smoke and heat away from all the fancy new equipment on her foremast and superstructure. Released back into the wild in October 1942, she would need some time to work up her new crew and test out all her systems, and as a result her combat debut would have to wait until May 1943, when she arrived along with the Pennsylvania and Idaho as part of Fire Support Task Group 51.1, providing gunfire support for the invasion of Atu, one of the two Aleutian Islands that the Japanese had seized the previous year. After a week of bombardment duty, the situation was considered stable enough that she was recalled to Norfolk Navy Yard on the US East Coast for further work, during which time she received a number of additional minor improvements, the most visually striking of which was the installation of a big radar lattice on her main mast, which helps to distinguish photos of her taken shortly after she re-entered service from those taken after this secondary refit. All this work was done relatively quickly, and she would spend the rest of 1943 on convoy escort duty in the Atlantic. Although the German capital ship threat was reduced by this stage, there was still a danger of Scharnhorst or Tirpitz making a break for the Atlantic and the presence of an older and slower battleship had proven to be a deterrent, at least to the former, during Operation Berlin. Plus, of course, she could easily crush any Panzerschiff or lesser raider like a bug. But at the end of 1943, the Scharnhorst met its end at the Battle of North Cape, and so the need for this duty was much reduced. With the best will in the world, Nevada was unlikely to be able to stop Tirpitz, and in any case, that particular ship wasn't going anywhere fast, since Royal Navy X-Craft had heavily damaged her a few months earlier by the easy-to-mention but difficult-to-execute method of stacking large amounts of explosives under her keel. And so in 1944, Nevada began preparation for supporting the D-Day invasion at Normandy. Here, she would become the flagship for Rear Admiral Deo, and would thus lead the bombardment forces off Utah and Omaha beaches which were those which were assigned to the U.S. Armed Forces. She would be joined by two other older U.S. battleships, the Arkansas and Texas, along with a range of smaller craft. Her first targets would be the German gun batteries at Azeville, but she spread her attention across a range of German positions, ending the day with 337 main battery rounds and 2,700 or so 5-inch sent down range in support of the Utah beach landings. As the invasion progressed, she switched to direct supporting fire for the advancing Allied troops, until a week and a half after the initial landings, the front line had moved beyond the range of her guns, and so she instead moved further along the coast to shoot at some large German shore batteries around the port of Cherbourg. Once the need for her services in the general Normandy area had diminished, she was reallocated to another landing on French soil, this being Operation Dragoon, which was on the French Mediterranean coast, in company with her two recent compatriot battleships from the Normandy landings, plus the British HMS Ramillies and the free French battleship Lorraine. Her assignment in this case was singular. The Germans had built a fortress centred around some of the guns salvaged from Lorraine's sister ship Provence, and so it had the capability of really mucking with the landings. In an on-again, off-again duel with the fortress, Nevada spent over a week lobbing shells at it, including a six-and-a-half-hour gun duel on the 23rd of August, which saw over 350 rounds lofted at the concrete and steel emplacements. 
Whilst this might initially seem like a failure as the fortress wasn't destroyed, the mission was in fact highly successful in that the attentions of the German manned guns were kept largely on counterfire missions against the various battleships, which, if they were hit, could afford to take a round or two. And thus, the German guns were entirely unable to do all that much about the hundreds of far more fragile landing ships and troop transports which were scuttling around behind the battleships, and whose contents then showed up at the fortress front door on the 28th to bring them the good news about the German troops' new lord and saviour, a white flag. This somewhat moonscaped fortress and its garrison took these words to heart, dearly repented, and converted themselves to a peaceful modern art exhibition of shattered concrete and masonry by the ritual ceremony of flag replacement with the aforementioned colourless ensign. With Allied troops in Europe largely having moved beyond the range of battleship-based gunfire support, Nevada was then recalled to New York for another refit. This resulted in some further small visual alterations as old systems were removed or replaced, but the most notable for this refit is that she is supposed to have had three 14-inch guns from Turret 1 taken out and replaced with the three guns that had been salvaged from Turret 3 of USS Arizona, these guns having been modernised in the interim. There was still much demand, however, for large calibre fire support in the Pacific Theatre, where many of the islands held by Japanese forces were pleasingly, entirely, or almost entirely, within battleship firing range, and so Nevada began to sail around the continental United States and across the Pacific, fetching up off Iwo Jima in mid-February 1945. Whilst small, the capture of this island would provide a dual bonus for the US. It would deny the Japanese air bases from which they could try to intercept B-29 bombing raids, which they'd been doing with some limited success in the skies, and therefore had also tried directly attacking the B-29 bases further south in the Marianas, whilst also allowing the US, of course, to place its own long-range fighters on the island, which could escort the B-29s in on their raids on the Japanese home islands, thus further improving B-29 survivability. A secondary benefit was that Iwo Jima could also serve as an emergency landing field for damaged B-29s, that might not otherwise make it home, which would at the very least preserve the bomb crews. Nevada met up once more with Texas and Arkansas, and the trio were now joined by New York, Idaho and Tennessee, and then somewhat later by USS West Virginia. Accurate fire from dug-in Japanese positions, as well as quite a lot of them deciding they were going to hold their fire entirely until US troops were heavily present ashore, would make the invasion something of a grinding struggle. Nevada herself remained unscathed, but resorted to utilising the deep waters around the island to close in to about a third of a mile offshore and provide accurate direct fire support from there. At those kinds of ranges, the shells would arrive at their target in less than a second, and you could almost bore sight the main guns on your chosen targets if you so wanted to. This task was concluded with the ship's withdrawal on the 7th of March, heading for the next invasion, that of Okinawa, which was due to begin later in the month, with the Nevada making a brief stop at Ulithi for resupply along the way. Bombardment began on the 26th, but here Nevada would get her first taste of significant damage courtesy of the enemy since Pearl Harbor itself, when the following morning a number of kamikaze showed up when the bombardment group was not covered by a combat air patrol. One of the Japanese aircraft headed for Nevada and held its course despite multiple hits from many AA guns. Although reduced to little more than a collection of burning parts that just so happened to be in a close formation, the aircraft nonetheless ploughed into the deck adjacent to turret 3, causing 60 casualties, 11 of them fatal, as well as temporarily disabling turret 3 and a trio of Orlikan emplacements. Over the next three months, multiple ships would receive varying degrees of damage from similar attacks, but Nevada's only other damage would be five rounds which she received from a concealed Japanese shore battery that managed to open up at point-blank range. These hits killed two crewmen, but unfortunately for the Japanese, the 4.7-inch gun turned out to be capable of only inflicting minor damage and was silenced in return by several full salvos from the main battery. At the end of June 1945, she was then reassigned to the Third Fleet and sailed to the Japanese home islands, but the war would end before the bombardment rotation got around to her on that assignment. 
In anticipation of the war continuing off the Japanese home islands, a series of anti-aircraft improvements had been planned for the ship, including new radars, multiple Mark 57 fire control systems and Mark 51 directors, and even more 40mm Bofors. But with the Japanese surrender after the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, these plans were abandoned. Instead, she was briefly stationed in Tokyo Harbour, and then recalled home. Judged too old to even be part of a reserve fleet, she was painted bright orange and then made the target ship for the Able bomb drop during Operation Crossroads. Thanks to the US AAF missing the brightly painted ship rather considerably, considering they had a nuke, she was then part of Test Baker, which she also survived, if somewhat irradiated, and after some analysis to determine how difficult decontamination would be, spoiler alert, very, she was towed away from Pearl Harbor in July 1948 for use as a gunnery target. USS Iowa and a couple of smaller vessels did their best, but given that the Japanese attack on December 7th, followed by two nukes, hadn't managed to put her down, a few 16-inch super heavy shells and a handful of 8-inch thrown in for good measure weren't really honestly ever going to put Nevada down either, and she eventually had to be sent to Davy Jones' locker by a torpedo bomber. There she remains, with the wreck rediscovered in remarkably good shape, given all she went through, in 2020. Next up, we have USS California. As one of the Big Five, the Tennessee and Colorado classes, she'd been scheduled for a modernization anyway to extend her service life whilst the US replaced its battleship fleet with the new fast battleships. Indeed, USS Colorado had already headed off for such a refit and so missed the December 7th attacks. As a result, the plans for a much more extensive program of works to California were simply advanced a little. But as it turned out, even these plans would also need major modifications. Colorado's planned modernization was partially abandoned in a bid to get her back to see ASAP, but it was clear, amongst other things, that the deck armour of the Big Five was not going to stand up to modern threats, which in the US was rated as the ability to withstand a 1,600-pound bomb that was dropped by a dive bomber coming in at a decent altitude. The existing 3.5-inch plate would in theory work against such a threat, but only if the bomb was dropped below 3,000 feet. So amongst the revisions for California and the other Big Five was the installation of another three inches of armour over the magazines and an additional two inches of armour over the machinery. But just this weight alone was looking to add over 1,300 tonnes to the ship's displacement, and that didn't account for any additional anti-aircraft guns, radar, fire control systems, superstructure, the extra men to man, all of that, etc, etc. So when, after a 10-day voyage, California arrived at Puget Sound on the 20th of October 1942, much bigger changes were in store for her. The entire gun battery, with the exception of the main guns, was removed, along with every scrap of superstructure, leaving her looking a little bit like a suspiciously high-riding monitor. To compensate for the deck armour and all the other new things that were about to be added, a double layer of blisters were installed, which took her beam up to 114 feet, essentially confining her to the Pacific as she'd be too wide to go through the Panama Canal, and if she was needed in another theatre, she would therefore either have to go via South America, round Chile and Argentina, or all the way around the world via the Indian Ocean. Further bulkheads were installed within the hull to further strengthen her against underwater damage, and with the new deck armour installed, the rest of the upgrades could begin. The main battery was upgraded to the latest standard achievable for her 14-inch guns, which would now be supplied with data by a pair of Mark 34 gun directors. Now, the Mark 34 was usually found as the gun director on cruiser main batteries, but it just so happened there were a bunch of spares lying around thanks to the conversion of a number of Cleveland-class-like cruisers, which were of course in the process of becoming the Independence-class-like carriers. The mixture of 5-inch 51 surface action and 5-inch 25 anti-aircraft guns, which had all been removed at this point, were replaced, like on Nevada, with eight twin 5-inch 38 mounts in a similar miniature pyramid formation on each side. 
This was positioned partially on a Sponson style arrangement that was made possible by the increase in beam thanks to the blisters and the remaining space between the 5 inch mounts and the new superstructure could then be supplied with a nice long line of quadruple 40mm bofers. The initial plan being for 10 such mountings, 5 per side mounted at a level that would allow them to fire over the top of the higher 5 inch 38 mounts at not just 0 degrees elevation but even with a degree of depression as well. The original conning tower and tube was removed but in this case it would be replaced by a lighter unit, again taken from a light cruiser, which weighed less than a tenth of the original but provided just as much effective protection against blast, splinters, small caliber shell hits and really practically anything other than a direct hit by a major caliber round or a particularly heavy bomb, which as we've seen through history even a heavily armoured conning tower probably wouldn't save you from either. Her cage masts were already gone, having been removed at Pearl Harbor during the salvage work, and one of which was actually already enjoying a new life as a signal tower at an airfield. But in their place went a modern tower foremast that somewhat resembled that found on US fast battleships, and a simple pole mainmast which was attached to a smaller tower aft. The small tower supported one of the ship's fire control systems, whilst the pole was there mainly to support radio antenna, flags, and a few other bits of electronic equipment. The new superstructure was, generally speaking, something of an elegant compromise, as it had to incorporate multiple additional features, such as a radar plot room, main battery fire control, and various other such facilities, but also had to remain narrow enough so as not to interfere with the SG surface search radar, and it had to keep the firing arcs for the anti-aircraft battery as clear as possible. The two original funnels were trunked into a single larger unit, and the whole thing was powered by a new set of boilers, which limited the loss of speed to around about a knot, which wasn't bad considering her greatly increased underwater surface area, less favourable length to beam ratio, and the additional seven to 8,000 tonnes of displacement that she was now carrying. However, all this work took a fair bit of time, made longer still by priority being diverted to brand new ships that needed fitting out, and other ships that were coming in damaged and which could be made whole again considerably faster. As a result, with a rather large complement of 2,250 men or thereabouts aboard, she only completed her refit and began sea trials at the end of January 1944. That isn't to say she missed out on all the action though. After working up, she sailed for the Marianas Islands, joining up with Task Group 52.17 under Admiral Oldendorf on the 8th of June. As we saw earlier with Nevada's wartime activities, the Marianas offered a potential base for B-29 raids on the Japanese home islands, and at this stage, it was also in the way of an attack on the Philippines. And of course, Japanese aircraft were currently operating from the very airfields the US wanted, and attacking Allied shipping, which was annoying, and they wanted them to stop. Along with California were her sister ship Tennessee, as well as the Colorado and Maryland, four out of the five of the Big Five. The remaining ship, West Virginia, was just coming out of her own refit, and so was not present. Task Group 52.10, with Pennsylvania, Idaho, and New Mexico also showed up, and the seven battleships and their escorts headed for Saipan. Expecting that the Japanese Navy would commit its fleet to the defence of this final major barrier before the Japanese home islands, the US Navy wasn't pulling any punches. As well as deploying the seven old battleships, seven out of the eventual ten US Navy fast battleships were also present. Washington, North Carolina, Iowa, New Jersey, South Dakota, Alabama, and Indiana. And that was before you started listing off all the aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, submarines, etc., etc. Over the next few days, the older battleships actually did somewhat better in the shore bombardment role than the newer ones, as Admiral Lee had been careful to drill his crews extensively in surface naval engagements ahead of possible sorties by the Japanese Navy, whilst California and her older friends had drilled almost exclusively in shore bombardment and were making extensive use of spotting aircraft. The Japanese did manage to get hit back in, Another of their ubiquitous 4.7-inch guns landing a single hit on California that caused 11 casualties, including one fatality, and also started a small fire and knocked out the main air search radar, 
But this didn't stop the ship's bombardment, which continued on with little to no interruption aside from putting out the fire. The next day, as the US Marines went ashore, California was quite happily reducing Japanese field artillery to sharp confetti when a group of Type 95 and Type 97 tanks were spotted heading for the American landings. Although not exactly the best tanks in the world at this point, the Japanese tanks were still more than capable of causing havoc amongst the freshly landed and mostly infantry marines. And so California, which massed about as much as over 2,700 Chihars, or almost 5,500 Hargos, engaged the armoured unit with its guns, reportedly nailing at least one unfortunate tank with a direct hit. California then remained offshore for the next few days, providing anti-aircraft cover with her secondary and dedicated anti-aircraft guns, and eventually acting in direct fire support of the troops via radio from observers on the front line, which was especially helpful when dealing with Japanese nighttime counterattacks. Indeed, her anti-aircraft guns proved slightly over-enthusiastic. At one point, one of her 40mm batteries accidentally sent a few rounds bouncing off the armour of one of her 5-inch mounts, whilst both were trying to shoot down an incoming Japanese army Ki-61. By the 22nd of June, it was time to withdraw, resupply and rearm before heading over to Guam which promised to become an excellent forward staging ground for the US Navy if it could be recaptured. California arrived along with Tennessee on the 19th, a day after the initial round of bombardment by Colorado, Pennsylvania, Idaho and New Mexico, and two days later the troops of the 3rd Marine Division went ashore. Later that afternoon, California headed off to Saipan as she'd used up most of her ammunition, and then, after being restocked, headed off to Tinian and undertook a successful diversionary bombardment that drew Japanese troops out of position prior to the landings there. This was further helped by some rather inventive Seabees who, realising that the two small beaches on the island would almost certainly be heavily defended, managed to reinvent a form of maritime siege ladder in the form of a series of ramps mounted onto LVTs, which then allowed the landings to take place on the narrow cliffs that bounded the rest of the island, completely bypassing the out-of-position Japanese troops, which resulted in the island being captured in a little over a week and giving the lowest number of Allied deaths relative to the size of Japanese defensive forces in the entire campaign in this island chain. Indeed, it was over so quickly that California was able to be sent back to Guam to help finish off the fighting that was still going on there. Once that battle finally wrapped up, the ship headed back to Espiritu Santo for more resupply in preparation for the attack on the Philippines. Along the way, Tennessee had a steering malfunction that caused her to veer into California, poking a hole in the latter's bow, but although the offending ship was badly damaged enough to have to head back to Pearl Harbor, California was able to sail on and entered the large floating dry dock USS Artisan, aka ABSD-1, for a couple of weeks of repairs, then headed back out for the Philippines campaign in mid-September. She joined up with Task Group 77.2 and opened up on Japanese defences starting on the 20th of October, seeing off the occasional kamikaze attack, but unknown to the men of the California at the time, the Japanese fleet had already set sail for a counterattack they labelled Operation Shogo-1, but which would become known to most of us as the Battle of Leyte Gulf. In the evening of the 24th, the Japanese Navy's southern force, made up of the battleships Fuso and Yamashiro, along with the heavy cruiser Megami and four destroyers, began its approach to the Surigao Strait. They were supposed to have been joined by two more heavy cruisers, a light cruiser and four more destroyers, but the rendezvous was missed due to strict radio silence. PT boats, destroyers and cruisers began to engage the Japanese ships as they advanced up Surigao Strait, and then at 0312 in the morning, California spotted the Japanese forces on her radar. The newly arrived USS West Virginia was the first to open fire, followed shortly thereafter by the California and then the other battleships just before 0400. She fired for about 16 minutes, almost hitting her sister ship physically, not with her guns, as the result of a misunderstood order to turn, but nonetheless she sent 63 armour-piercing shells into the cauldron, although her own gunfire disabled much, but not all, of her own gunnery control radar, and one of the guns in turret 4 was suffered a misfire. 
After a ceasefire was called by Admiral Aldendorf, who was a bit concerned by reports, fortunately erroneous, of friendly fire, what was left of the Japanese Navy's southern force gradually retreated, only to have the last surviving battleship, the rather battered Yamashiro, torpedoed and sunk, and the badly shot up Nagami rammed by the late arriving Nachi. Initially, California and the other battleships chased the retreating Japanese south, but with the dawn came reports of poor old Taffy Three being attacked by the center force in what was about to become the Battle of Samar. And so the old battleships wheeled about and headed north to see what they could do to help. But by the time they got anywhere close, Admiral Karita had already had enough and left. Things settled down after that, and a month later California headed off for another repair and resupply run, rejoining the bombardment group in January 1945 in preparation for the invasion of Lingayen Gulf, the next stage in the invasion of the Philippines. Coming under intense kamikaze attack, the force lost the escort carrier Omani Bay, and on the afternoon of the 6th, a pair of kamikazes headed for the California. One was shot down, but the other hit the ship on the port side, adjacent to the little pole mainmast. As the aviation fuel from the kamikaze sent up a massive fireball, a 5-inch round from another US ship struck almost immediately thereafter. Possibly this round had actually been aimed at the recently departed kamikaze, but in any case it penetrated one of the 5-inch mountings, starting a second fire. Both fires were contained, but at the cost of 45 dead and another 151 injured. But since the overall damage to the ship's fighting capacity was negligible, she remained on station and commenced bombarding the coastline. Between California and the other ships in the group, the Japanese decided to withdraw from the area around the beaches, which allowed the US Marines to make an almost unopposed landing. With this stage of operations completed, she then headed for Puget Sound via Ulithian Pearl Harbor for repairs and upgrades. When she returned in June, setting up shop off Okinawa, she was carrying no less than 56 40mm Bofors in 14 quadruple mountings and 80 20mm Orlikans in 40 twin mounts. Here it was shore bombardment and kamikaze attacks again, but after breaking off to restock her supplies and conduct maintenance, she found the war over following the Japanese signalling their surrender. Much like Nevada, this curtailed plans for further upgrades. In California's case, this was to have been a new radar, a Mark 57 fire control system, or rather quite a few of them, and two more quadruple 40mm. Instead, she was shortly ordered to return to the USA, except of course she would go the long way around, stopping via Singapore and Cape Town before heading to Philadelphia. Remember, she couldn't use the Panama Canal thanks to her increased beam. Once she got to Philadelphia, she was placed in reserve in 1946 and then decommissioned the following year. But she remained in mothballs for almost another decade and a half, only being sent to the breakers in 1959. Finally, for today, we'll look at the most damaged of all the ships that were successfully salvaged, USS West Virginia. Weirdly enough, there actually isn't all that much to say about her modernization compared to the previous two ships, and that's because in many ways it followed the pattern that was set down by the refit done to the previous Big Five ships, like California. However, there were a few differences. Because she arrived last at Puget Sound of all the Pearl Harbor battleships, showing up in May 1943, she would receive the final refinement of the US battleship modernization program. This meant that she would have SK Air Search and SG Surface Search radar capability planned in right from the start, and whilst the conning tower replacement, new main gun fire control system and funnel trunking were all the same, as was the layout of her eight new twin 5-inch 38 mountings, her 10 quad 40mm Bofors mountings were laid out a little bit differently. Three ran down each side amidships, inboard of the 5-inch battery, whilst one was placed in a super-firing position over turret 2, and another placed in a super-firing position over turret 3, with the last two placed down on the deck, roughly adjacent to turret 3. This slightly unusual layout nonetheless meant that at least on the broadside, she could bring six of these quadruple mountings to bear instead of the five on California. 43 20mm Orlikans were also included, but all this came at a cost in time. She spent a good portion of the war waiting for Tennessee and California to finish work, 
and so when her widened hull sailed once more, it was already summer 1944. As a result, her sea trials weren't finished until mid-September, when she was assigned to escort the brand new carrier USS Hancock to Task Force 58. Arriving at the staging point of Say Adler Harbour on the 5th of October, she joined Task Group 77.2, consisting of her sister ship Maryland, along with the Mississippi, Pennsylvania, and of course the sisters California and Tennessee. On the 19th of October, the opening bombardment of the late A Gulf operation saw West Virginia send almost 280 main gun rounds, just over a third of her entire magazine load, downrange, along with around 1,500 five inch shells. Unfortunately, she got a little too close to the shore, skimming the seabed and damaging three of her propellers, which limited her to 16 knots, unless you wanted to be sitting on a 40,000 plus ton massage chair with no padding. But, since Japanese emplacements were not really capable of running away, she stuck around even at this reduced speed, with a bombardment group withdrawing each night just in case of any sneak attacks, and then coming back in the morning for more shelling. On the night of the 24th, of course, her so new you could practically smell the pack in Greece radar systems saw the Japanese southern force coming up the gauntlet of Surigao Strait before any of the other battleships, and she thus became the first of these vessels to open fire on her targets that night, hitting Yamashiro repeatedly with some of her 16 salvos, totaling 91 shells expended, since some of the salvos hadn't involved all of the main guns, and this probably included a first salvo hit on the bridge of Yamashiro. When it was clear that the advances on Leyte were going well, West Virginia was released to Espiritu Santo via Ulithi. Espiritu Santo, which had been the forward operating base back in the dark days of the Guadalcanal campaign, was now a second line base, but it was also home, if you recall California's visit, to the USS Artisan, that big floating dry dock. And so West Virginia was duly dry docked for repairs to her propellers, and was then back off the Philippines by the end of November, alternating between shooting at Japanese positions on land and Japanese aircraft in the sky, as kamikaze attacks continued to try and batter the US forces into submission. After resupply in early December, she was assigned as flagship from, for the covering force for the landings on Mindoro, which passed relatively quickly, allowing her to join the attack on Lingayen Gulf at the start of 1945. She alternated bombardment duty here with sweeps through the South China Sea to deter seaborne attacks on the landings, before heading off to restock after two weeks on the firing line, having managed to half-empty her magazines. Then it was on to Iwo Jima, where she led a relatively charmed life, a single hit from enemy fire resulting in one wounded man was the sum total of her damage, whilst in return she managed, amongst other things, to land a hit on some kind of explosive or fuel-heavy supply dump, which burned and periodically exploded quite happily for a couple of hours after the initial hit, which I imagine racked up quite to the damage combo multiplier for the ship in her bombardment duties that day. Then it was back to Ulithi at the beginning of March to reload once more, in time for the invasion of Okinawa. Here, she was back to the usual switch back and forth between anti-shore and anti-kamikaze stations. The former never got closer to her than a few thousand yards, but the latter did manage to cause some problems. She lucked out somewhat when, in the evening of the 1st of April, a kamikaze hit her superstructure. This caused 11 casualties, four of which were fatal, amongst the nearby 20mm Orlikon crews. But the bomb that the aircraft was carrying managed to make its way quite deep into the ship. But then it failed to detonate, and was safely deactivated and removed later on by the ship's crew. Since she was still able to fight, she stayed on station, and a week later was called up along with others to form a backstop line of defence against the incoming Japanese super battleship Yamato, which was heading for Okinawa on a one-way mission. But then the aircraft from Task Force 58 had to go and ruin all the fun by making that one-way mission's final stop a little bit sooner than the Japanese Navy would have preferred, and so West Virginia was denied a chance to take another shot at a Japanese battleship so she went back to shooting up shore positions on Okinawa instead. She was then training off the Philippines for Operation Downfall, when news came in that, of course, this wouldn't be necessary as Japan had surrendered. 
and so she headed for Tokyo anyway to observe the surrender ceremonies, and possibly rub her survival in the face of a few Japanese Navy officials, and then after a few weeks headed off home with several hundred passengers aboard, all of whom were rather eager to get back to the United States. Like all of the other older ships, she had been due to have a new anti-aircraft fit prepared in time for the invasion of Japan. This time it would have been multiple new radars, the Mark 57 fire control systems, and four additional quadruple and two twin 40mm Bofors, plus filling in any remaining space with twin 20mm Orlikans. And no, I'm not even joking, that's exactly what it says on the order papers. She pulled into San Diego in late October 1945, but then, after a brief pause to allow people to visit her on Navy Day, headed back for Pearl Harbor, the first of several runs bringing US service personnel home as part of Operation Magic Carpet. And then, in early 1946, she was put into reserve and parked up alongside her sister Colorado in Seattle. Like California, she would remain on the books, technically speaking, for the rest of the 1940s and 1950s, before being sold off for disposal in 1959, and then scrapped two years later. And that's a brief history of the refit and return of the three ships that were sunk and then salvaged at Pearl Harbor. Let me know in the comments below if you'd like a quick summary of the exploits of the three ships that were damaged and repaired after Pearl Harbor, and we'll see about maybe including that in a fun Friday at some point down the line. For now, thanks for listening. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.